Praise be you, my Lord, through our sister, Mother Earth, who sustains and directs us. <clears throat> So I was going to start my sermon with a story from St. Francis. How many of you know that St. Francis was, him and the birds had a relationship. <laughs> Meaning that when he was out walking, he often would come upon a flock of birds. And he would stop there with the birds and he would sermonize them. So he would tell them about God. He would speak to them about how beautiful and wonderful they were and how God created them to be that way. So that's how I was going to start my sermon. But then Job spoke to me more. Because of all the news we've had this week, especially the news from yesterday that probably left most of us really and so, in Job, we get a picture of creation that most of us would describe as Darwin's um, in Darwin's terms about the strongest and the fittest. Most of us would see what Job reads as animals that are wild and untamed and out of control, and their survival requires them to be dangerous, powerful. I mean, take, for example, what he says about the horse, right? He doesn't talk about the horse as the free wild creature, right? The one who, who roams and jumps and has herds that flock through the mountains. Instead, he talks about the horse as it is used by humans in war, right? But he also talks about the ostrich who could care less about their young, who just has the egg and then wanders off. Or he talks about the eagle who flies majestically, killing its prey and then feeding blood to its baby. And so there's this survival of the fittest feeling to this scripture passage, right? Is it? Here's the thing. How do we talk about that? The survival of the fittest? Because I was thinking about this is, I don't know if any of you have watched the National Parks on Netflix with Barack Obama. So, in episode two, no, it's episode three. Episode three, they're in Africa. And they're in the Sahil. And in there, they show this watering hole where the black rhinos come. And now the black rhinos were almost made extinct by the hunting of them. But they have risen back to population as they created this sanctuary, this national park for the animals to survive in and be safe. <clears throat> and so in this episode, those rhinos come to this hole which the rangers fill with water because they're experiencing huge drought and they no longer have a watering hole during the dry season. And at that watering hole, we begin in this wonderful image. Um, they show us how they have learned to use a technology that goes from black and white night pictures to full color, but it's still night. And you see the, the mothers and the calves coming to the watering hole and drinking and greeting their friends and the calves are playing with each other And then the black rhino that's in charge, who has a name that the rangers have given him because he's the oldest rhino they know on the park range, comes to the watering hole and chases away those that shouldn't be there. So the pack of zebras, the leopards. 
But then he does a survival of the fittest thing, and I'm thinking I'm not a real big fan of rhinos anymore. <laughs> Especially after yesterday when there were all sorts of protests about women. And this rhino decides that a young female, not yet mating age, he deserves. And so he chases her and butts her with his horns. He is horrendous to this female. She finally runs away. And so when we think of survival of the fittest, that is the image we have, right? We think of Darwin looking at nature, seeing that rhino, and thinking what we need to survive is the one who is the strongest, the most powerful, can control what is going on. But here's the thing. Darwin didn't actually say that. That that's what you've been taught survival of the fittest is. But you need to read the whole book, okay? Because Darwin didn't even invent that term. And when that was invented by another scientist to claim what Darwin had said, he said, that's not what I was talking about. I was arguing for sympathy among animals as being the reason they thrive and survive. So in that same episode, that Barack Obama is telling us about. There's a hornbill bird and a family of mongoose. So, I don't know if you know about the hornbills and the mongoose, but the mongoose are so cute and adorable, honestly. They were preening themselves and getting all ready, and the hornbill is like, go, people. It's time to eat. When they're ready, they set out and start finding all the bugs that they can to eat. And the hornbill comes along behind and cleans up their leftovers. They demonstrate what Darwin was talking about. That life is supposed to be about cooperation and sympathy and kindness and compassion. That that is what actually makes species survive. The ones who thrive and expand have some sort of cooperation in their nature. So this became very clear when I was in college and one of my areas of studies was, at the time it was called feminist studies, now they call it gender studies I think. But back then it was feminist studies and they talked about science and how when these women scientists come along, they prove that evolution is different than we expected it to be. That there's a lot more cooperation amongst species that help in the development and evolution of, of our world. And they think that is why humanity was so good at populating. It wasn't because they were powerful and strong and could wipe out all those mammoths, right? It was because they could work together to make sure that their families were fed. Like it was the joining together that made them thrive. It wasn't their ability to be strong and powerful. But in our culture, we have taken that idea of the strongest and most powerful and have said that's who we are. That's who we're meant to be. And we see it so much on display right now. Our society has become a society that thinks that's what it should be. That the strongest and most powerful, the richest, should be the ones that control. And they forgot that what actually makes us powerful is our ability to cooperate, our ability to have compassion and kindness and sympathy for each other. And when things get so out of whack, where that sympathy and kindness and compassion is not working, that's when societies start to fall apart. 
That's when empires begin to tumble. And that's where we're at. And the reason this stuck with me last night is because is that what the Buffalo shooting was about? Then in order for in order for white people to thrive and survive, that young man thought he had to kill those who weren't white. In order to be the most powerful, he picked up a gun and traveled 200 miles. 200 miles to kill those who were different from them. But the thing is, that isn't the only story that's made about that, right? That isn't the only story in the news about gun violence and white supremacy. We also have the stories from Dallas. We also have the stories from Dallas where there's this red maroon van that is going around to beauty parlors, specifically Asian-owned beauty parlors, and killing the people that are inside. That happened this week also. And then you didn't know that violence happened in last night in Chicago. Did you know that? That there was also gun violence there at one of the biggest tourist spots in the city in Grand Park, outside the Bean, and I have no idea why Chicago has a Bean, but it has a Bean right in the middle of the park that you can see yourself in. And for whatever reason, when those young people were angry, they had guns. And because they had guns, they were able to shoot each other. We have become that wild, wild west that sense that the strongest and fittest and most powerful should survive. So how do we teach something different? And this is how I get us back to St. Francis, right? <laughs> Did you know that St. Francis believed so powerfully in the diversity of creation? He believed that everything in creation, everything, had the ability to teach us about God. That's why we've been going through his song to creation. And in each line, he calls a different part of creation a sibling, right? So he started out with the stars and the solar system and moved to water and fire and wind. And this week, he moves to plants and Mother Earth and what nourishes and sustains us. Francis believed that all of creation, every bit of it, every little part, could teach us about God, could teach us about the presence of God, could teach us about the wonder and mystery of God, that if we got still and listened, we would learn more about who God is. That Francis's image isn't really Job's image, right? If you read the stories about Francis and nature, you hear about a man who spent half of his year out in the wilderness. Okay, it's Italy, so it probably wasn't all that wild. But outside, in caves, in lean-tos, in hermitages, he spent time outside in those places being quiet and silent with God. It was in nature, in the silence of those flowers and birds, that he heard God speak to him about reviving the church. It was in the silence of nature that he began to see his connection to every other part 
of the world. To see God's presence in the great diversity that is out there. St. Francis learned to teach us that we can too experience that wonder that God gives us. That we can learn and know about God. That's what Job wants us to do, right? Learn and know about God. To understand God, to be present with God, to hear God's presence <clears throat> among us. And to know that God is present even in the places that we don't experience God. And so Francis <coughs> had these wonderful relationships with creation. There's a story told about him and crickets. That one of the crickets came into the house, and have you ever had that happen? And how annoying it is because you hear them, but you cannot find them, right? And then they just go off. But he told all his brothers that that was a moment for prayer. That that was a moment to listen to the song of that cricket. And so the cricket stayed with them for a few weeks until Francis believed that they got the message and then they freed the cricket back to the outdoors. But he also did it in simple ways. In the friary garden, he told all his brothers that they needed to leave a portion of the garden that was set aside for wildflowers and herbs to grow. Because if those wildflowers and herbs grew wild there in the friary garden, you would, every time you went out to get food, would experience the wonder of God, would experience the beauty of creation, would know about God and God's presence. So what do we do with these feelings that we have? This sense that the world is out of control and there's not much we can do individually to change it? I wonder about that often because my job each week is to motivate you to change, right? And yet, how do we fix something that we are not up close to? I think that you started on that path in a way that a lot of churches haven't. You started on that path by saying we can bring a diverse group of people together who may not agree on everything, and you are allowed to disagree with the pastor, by the way. You can tell me how I'm wrong in the sermon. Who brought a diverse group of people together and said, this, this is what community looks like. That community looks like all of us in our diversity, in our wonder, in our different experiences, coming together to learn from each other, to share with each other, to nourish each other, to be the presence of God, showing the world that diversity, that community that invites all of us is what we are called to. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for all the wonder of creation, for the plants that nourish and sustain us. Praise the Lord for the compassion and kindness that brings us together. 